Welcome to Washington Today for December 28th, 2022. I'm Gary Sterikoff. Thanks for joining us today. Here are some headlines. Southwest Airlines is facing federal scrutiny after it canceled thousands of flights nationwide over the holiday weekend. According to TheHill.com, Southwest's problems can't completely be blamed on winter storms. While other airlines had some weather-related cancellations, Southwest shut down more than 15,000 flights over the holidays. We'll hear from Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg and Southwest CEO Bob Jordan coming up. The Biden administration has announced that it will require a negative COVID test for all air travelers coming to the U.S. from China. The announcement follows a surge of COVID-19 cases across China as the government there has eased its strict zero COVID rules. The Biden administration's plan will take effect on January 5th. Anyone two years of age or older will need to show a negative result from a test taken within two days of their departure from airports on mainland China, Hong Kong, or Macau. The Chinese government ended its zero COVID policy on December 7th. It included mass testing, tracing, and lockdowns. Policy was ended following mass protests over it in November. One of the convicted architects of the plot to kidnap and assassinate Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer, Barry Croft Jr., was sentenced in a Grand Rapids courtroom to more than 19 years in prison earlier on Wednesday. That's an even longer sentence than the ringleader of that plot got just 24 hours ago. Adam Fox was sentenced to 16 years in federal prison. The men were convicted on charges of conspiring to kidnap Governor Whitmer, who in 2020 became the target of a series of far-right attacks in light of the state's COVID restriction policies. And some new research from the Washington Post. When the 118th Congress is sworn in on January 3rd, its members will walk the halls of a building whose paintings and statues pay homage to more than 140 slave owners. The Post analyzed more than 400 artworks in the U.S. Capitol building from the crypt to the rotunda and found that one third of them honored individuals who either owned slaves or fought on the Confederate side of the Civil War. You can read more at WashingtonPost.com. Now more on the holiday weekend travel chaos and specifically for those flying on Southwest Airlines. According to FlightAware.com on Monday, that's the day after Christmas, more than 70% of Southwest flights were canceled. More than 60% of Southwest flights were canceled yesterday and today. And earlier today, Democratic Senators Ed Markey of Massachusetts and Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut called on Southwest to provide, quote, significant compensation for stranded travelers. Both are members of the Senate Commerce Committee and both say the airline can afford it because it plans to pay $428 million in dividends to stockholders next month. The U.S. Department of Transportation has also begun looking into the airline's cancellations. With more, here's Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg speaking to NBC News. Secretary, I want to go back to October of last year when Southwest had nearly the exact same problem. Thousands of flights canceled. How can travelers have faith in the airline and, to be frank, have faith in your department as a watchdog if these problems keep happening? Well, what we did, especially over the course of the problems we saw this year, was press the airlines to increase their customer service commitments. They did that. They did that in writing. And now that we have that in hand, we are able to hold them accountable to a higher standard than what was possible last year. Now, again, what we have going on right now is different for Southwest, this one airline, than what we're seeing across the rest of the system. As a watchdog, we are going to hold them accountable. And we're going to have to take a deeper look at what's going on with their scheduling systems. We all understand that uh, you can't control the weather. Uh, This has clearly crossed the line from what's an uncontrollable weather situation to something that is the airline's direct responsibility. And yesterday on Twitter, Southwest Airlines CEO Bob Jordan made this public apology. I want everyone who is dealing with the problems we've been facing, whether you haven't been able to get to where you need to go or you're one of our heroic employees caught up in a massive effort to stabilize the airline Uh, to know is that we're doing everything we can to return to a normal operation. And please also hear that I'm truly sorry. Here's why this giant puzzle is taking us several days to solve. Southwest is the largest carrier in the country, not only because of our value and our values, but because we build our flight schedule around communities, not hubs. 
So we're the largest airline in 23 of the top 25 travel markets in the U.S. Cities where large numbers of scheduled flights simultaneously froze as record bitter cold brought challenges for all airlines. You know, our network is highly complex and the operation of the airline counts on all the pieces, especially aircraft and crews remaining in motion to where they're planned to go. With our large fleet of airplanes and, and flight crews out of position in dozens of locations, and after days of trying to operate as much of our full schedule across the busy holiday weekend, we reached a decision point to significantly reduce our flying to catch up. We're focused on safely getting all of the pieces back into position uh, to end this rolling struggle. You know, I have nothing but pride and respect for the efforts of the people of Southwest who are showing up in every way. The tools we use to recover from disruption serve as well 99% of the time, but clearly we need to double down on our already existing plans to upgrade systems for these extreme circumstances so that we never again face what's happening uh, right now. I'm apologizing to them daily, and they'll be hearing more about our specific plans to ensure the challenges that they faced the past few days will not be part of our future. I reached out to Secretary Buttigieg earlier today to continue the discussions we've been having with the DOT through the holiday, uh, sharing all the things that we're doing to make things right for our customers. We always take care of our customers, and we will lean in and go above and beyond as they would expect us to. Teams are working on all of that, processing refunds, proactively reaching out and taking care of customers who are dealing with costly detours and reroutes. It's just a few examples. Our plan for the next few days is to fly a reduced schedule and reposition our people and planes, and we're making headway and we're optimistic to be back on track before next week. We have some real work to do in making this right. For now, I want you to know that we're committed to that. That's Southwest Airlines CEO Bob Jordan. The travel chaos will continue as another 2,300 Southwest flights are already canceled for Thursday. The nation's other major carriers are also responding, according to CBS News, American, United, and Delta all say they are capping fares between select cities, including many of the U.S. cities, to where Southwest also flies. You're listening to Washington Today. The new 118th Congress convenes on Tuesday, January 3rd, at noon Eastern. For the first time in two years, they'll return to Washington as a divided government. Republicans will control the House of Representatives, while Democrats retain control of the Senate by a slim majority. The new incoming members are younger, with an average age of 47, compared to the average age of 58 in the previous session. The new Congress will also be more diverse, with a record number of women serving, including more women of color. Follow the process as the 118th Congress gavels into session, holds the election for new Speaker of the House, and new members take the oath of office. New Congress, new leaders. Watch the opening day of the 118th Congress, Tuesday, January 3rd, at noon Eastern, live on C-SPAN and C-SPAN 2. Also on C-SPAN Now, our free mobile video app, or online at cspan.org. Washington Today continues now with some of the farewell speeches by members of the House who will not be returning for another term when the 118th Congress convenes next week. Steve Shabbat, Republican from Ohio, first elected in 1995, lost his seat in 2008, then came back two years later and regained it, and this year lost his re-election campaign. Steve Shabbat spoke on the House floor on December 13th. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's been an honor to represent the people of Greater Cincinnati in public office for more than 35 years now. I thought I'd take a few minutes to sum up those years. I first ran for office, Cincinnati City Council, when I was 26 years old. When this, my last term in Congress, expires uh, next month in January, I'll be turning 70. 26 to 70, that's long enough. It's somebody else's turn. I'd seriously uh, considered retiring and not running this past election cycle, but it was redistricting year. Uh, the congressional lines were being redrawn, uh, and I was concerned that if I didn't run, our district was going to be written off, uh, drawn in a way that only a Democrat could win it, uh, as had been done 10 years ago in Columbus and prior to that in Cleveland. 
I didn't want to see that happen to the people of greater Cincinnati who depended on me, trusted me to represent them as a common sense conservative for so many years. Redistricting turned out to be a pretty rocky process. Uh, I ended up with a, a nine point Biden district, making it the toughest Republican held seat in the country outside the state of uh, California. Despite starting out in a nine point hole, I hope that with a lot of hard work and a little luck, uh, we could hold it anyway, but I was wrong. Well, that's water over the dam. There's a Chinese proverb, uh, may you live in interesting times. My 26 years in Congress have certainly been that. I was first elected in the 1994 Republican Revolution, Newt Gingrich, the contract with America. Republicans took over the House for the first time in 40 years, which was my approximate uh, age at the time, and 73 freshman Republicans were elected. I'm the last one in the House out of 73 and I'll be gone in a few weeks. I've been asked a number of times, what are my proudest accomplishments during my time uh, here in Congress? Um, at the top of the list, um, I was, uh, <coughs> excuse me, at the top of the list was leading the effort to pass the ban on partial birth abortion. Fought that battle for eight years, all the way to the US Supreme Court. They upheld the law, and it's been described as the most significant pro-life legislation since Roe v. Wade. It's estimated that it saves about 20,000 innocent unborn babies every year from a particularly brutal death. Some have said my strong pro-life positions were a factor in my defeat this election. If so, it was worth it. Another accomplishment was having served as both chairman and ranking member of the House Small Business Committee, I was in the position to introduce, pass, and implement the PPP, the Paycheck Protection program during the recent pandemic. As a result, our district, the first congressional district, received more money, almost $3 billion, <clears throat> excuse me, got more small business loans, over 27,000 of them, and most importantly, saved more jobs, over 247,000 than any other congressional district uh, in Ohio. A lot of people's lives, both in our community and across the country, were positively impacted. Rather than list a whole bunch of other bills I've gotten passed over the years, I'm limited to just five minutes here this morning, uh, let me just tell you this. The University of Virginia, UVA, and Vanderbilt have together done three studies of Congress over the last 10 years in order to determine who are the most effective members of Congress. I'm proud to say that I was rated in the top 10 most effective members each time and when you consider that there are 435 of us, I'd say that's pretty good. Of course, I could have accomplished none of this without the hard work of my tremendous staff, both here in Washington and back in Cincinnati, and without the support of my family. My wife Don and I will be celebrating our 50th wedding anniversary this coming June. And we were blessed with a daughter, Erica, and a son, Randy, both adults now, and the two cutest grandchildren anywhere ever, Reed and Kira. And thank you to Kevin, our son-in-law, for creating and then overseeing my blog over the years. Finally, let me conclude with this. Despite all the rancor and controversy and partisanship that routinely goes on in this place, it was truly an honor to serve here in the People's House. And this extraordinary country, the United States of America is still the greatest country that ever existed on the face of the earth. Goodbye. And I go back to balance my time. Congressman Steve Shabbat, Republican from Ohio, giving his farewell speech on the House floor on December 13th. He lost his reelection bid to a Democrat this year. Congressman James Langevin, Democrat from Rhode Island, first elected in the year 2000, decided to not run again this year. He spoke on the House floor on December 14th about his making history as the first quadriplegic to serve in Congress. Mr. Speaker, I rise today with mixed emotions as this will likely be the final time that I speak in front of this chamber as a member of Congress. For the last 22 years, I have had the great privilege of serving the people of Rhode Island's 2nd Congressional District. It's been the honor of my lifetime to represent the voice and vote of my constituents. And I am so humbled by the faith and the trust that they have placed in me all these years. After my accident, 
it was my community that, uh, that was there for me when I needed them the most. And it was their constant love and support, along with my family, which ultimately inspired me to run for office as a way of giving back. My journey to recovery was not always an easy one. But thanks to my family, my faith, and my community, I was able to move forward and become the first quadriplegic ever to elected to the United States Congress. For the last 36 years, I have woken up every day with one goal in mind, giving good public service to the people of Rhode Island. That focus has held true since my early days in public service, beginning when I was elected as a delegate to Rhode Island's Constitutional Convention, continuing through my time in the General Assembly, and as the nation's youngest Secretary of State and it has remained strong throughout my final days as the United States Congressman. I will forever be grateful for the uh, enduring friendships and, and long-time uh, memories that I have, uh, I have forged here in this body. But most of all, I am so proud of all that we've been able to accomplish for the people of Rhode Island and the United States. I have fought to protect and advance the rights of Americans with disabilities, moving our society closer to becoming fully inclusive and accessible for all. On the Armed Services Committee, I have led the efforts to strengthen our national security and cybersecurity in particular. And I have been proud to support the hard-working men and women of my district who build the world's finest nuclear submarines at Electric Boat. As the chairman of the Subcommittee on Cyber Innovative Technologies and Information Systems, I fought to procure the finest cutting-edge technologies for our soldiers, sailors, airmen and guardians, and Marines, so that our women and men in uniform never enter a fair fight. Moreover, I've spoken up for our nation's foster youth, who are too often forgotten and left behind. And I've worked across the aisle to invest in job training, apprenticeships, and career and technical education. Looking back, I'll always be proud of my vote for President Obama's Affordable Care Act, which lowered health care costs and secured coverage for millions of uninsured Americans. And I will forever, uh, and I will never forget uh, the moment that I became the first congressman in a wheelchair to preside over the U.S. House of Representatives as Speaker Pro Tem as we marked the 20th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. I thank Speaker Pelosi, Nancy Pelosi, uh, perhaps the greatest House Speaker of the modern era, for making that day possible. Likewise, I thank Majority Leader Stanley Hoyer for his decades of friendship and leadership in passing the Americans with Disabilities Act and for his unrelenting efforts to make sure that the Capitol complex is accessible to all Americans of all abilities. I'd also like to express my gratitude to my colleagues in the, uh, the uh, congressional delegation, Jack, Sheldon, and David, for their friendship and support. I could not have asked for better colleagues to work with on behalf of our great state. Finally, I want to thank the dozens of dedicated staff members who have served in my office over the years, as well as my friends and my entire family, especially my mom, my late dad, my brothers, and my sister, uh, for standing by my side every step of this journey. Choosing not to seek re-election to Congress was one of the most difficult decisions of my life. But after two decades of living in two places and at the same time in weekly air travel, I'm ready to chart a new course. Although I will no longer be in Congress come the beginning of next year, I'm not going away. I'm just coming home. I love my state. I love the people who live there. So most of all, I want to say thank you, Rhode Island, for the opportunity to serve the community, which has given me so much. I will always cherish the time that I was blessed to represent you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I yield back the balance of my time. James Langevin, Democrat from Rhode Island, on the House floor on December 14th. He is retiring after 10 terms. Republican Congressman Peter Meyer of Michigan is leaving the House after one term. He was one of 10 House Republicans who voted to impeach former President Donald Trump in the second impeachment. Peter Meyer was defeated in a Republican primary. He spoke on the House floor December 21st. Madam Speaker, I rise today for the last time as a member of the 117th Congress. I do not seek to dwell on the circumstances of my departure, although it does bring to mind a few lines from Yeats's Second Coming. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Perhaps it takes a cataclysm like World War I to capture the naked and malevolent cynicism of our politics. Yeats also well captured the harrowing consequence of elite ineptitude that precipitated the slaughter of tens of millions. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy 
is loosed upon the world. I read and reread those words while flying out of Hamid Karzai International Airport last August during the shameful end to 20 years of America's war <clears throat> in Afghanistan. What I saw on the ground during that waking nightmare exemplified some of the best of the American men and women in uniform, but it also reflected the haplessness and incompetency of American policymaking. It's easy to question why we are here in this chamber, what our purpose is, and what it is we seek to achieve. I did not enter this body as some wide-eyed innocent. Three years in war zones had stripped me of that. But what I did not anticipate until I got here was how many of the problems we are confronting are problems of Congress's own making. Look at Afghanistan. Across the rotunda, we are fighting an uphill battle to pass the Afghan Adjustment Act so that our allies who risked their lives to support our operations aren't deported back to the same hell that 13 American service members sacrificed their lives to rescue them from. This should not be a Herculean task. Yet senators have the privilege of wrapping their hands around the neck of critical legislation and strangling it in back rooms. If they want to slit the throat of the Afghan Adjustment Act, let them do it on the Senate floor in full view of the allies and veterans they are betraying. The reason in the first place why we have to pass the Afghan Adjustment Act is due to the failure of our war in Afghanistan, a failure abetted by decades of Congress's lax oversight of the President and his Department of Defense. To solve this, I push for Congress to take back its war powers, to take back that constitutional responsibility. But even when it comes to Congress asserting its own prerogative, this body has shown itself unwilling to do its job. The current budget negotiations taking place on the other side of the rotunda also show a Congress unwilling to confront the very basic task of passing a budget on time. The last time we had a budget passed before the fiscal year started, I was in second grade. And here we sit, 72 hours before a government shutdown, while the Senate pats itself on the back for dropping a 4,155-page omnibus bill at 2 a.m. yesterday morning. When Congress is incapable of solving problems of its own making, how can the American people have any faith that we can tackle the problems arising from the broader world? What hope do we have of outcompeting China, of winning this coming century, if we can't even get out of a mess of our own making? We need the best to regain their convictions, to set an example of what clear-eyed leadership looks like both at home and abroad. We need to hold the worst to account and reprise the moral resolve that has led us through dark times in this country many, many times before. Too many have sacrificed too much for us to squander the opportunity before us, the opportunity to rise to the challenge of this moment, to set aside petty squabbles, the opportunity to build on the promise of limited government, economic freedom, and individual liberty, the promise that underpins the American dream. While I will not be in the 118th Congress to fight for the government our great people deserve, I remain steadfast to my commitment to make our nation at last worthy of the sacrifices made in its name. And I pray that the next Congress learns from the mistakes of the last two years, that we learn from the mistakes of decades before, and have the courage necessary to, to fulfill the promise of a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Thank you, and I yield back. Congressman Peter Meyer, Republican from Michigan on the House floor, beaten in a Republican primary as he ran for re-election after one term in office. More U.S. House member farewell speeches when Washington Today continues in a moment. Pre-order your copy of the Congressional Directory for the 118th Congress. It's your access to the federal government with bio and contact information for every House and Senate member. Important information on congressional committees, the president's cabinet, federal agencies, and state governors. Pre-order your copy today for delivery in March. It's $29.95 plus shipping and handling, and every purchase helps support our nonprofit operations at cspanshop.org. Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast on the C-SPAN Now mobile app and wherever you get your podcasts. Congresswoman Sherry Bustos, Democrat from Illinois, a former chair of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, 
is retiring from Congress after five terms. She gave her farewell speech on the House floor December 13th. Mr. Speaker, I rise to reflect upon a decade of service in Congress. Ten years ago, when I was first elected, I jotted down a list of goals that I hoped I would accomplish while serving the 17th Congressional District of Illinois. As I was cleaning my office recently, I ran across that list again, a window into what I was thinking before I was even first sworn into office. On that list, to build an exceptional constituent service program, to secure generous federal funding and support local projects, and to develop innovative and practical solutions to the real problems that people face every day. Reading it, I realized I never lost sight of what I came to Washington to do. Goal number one, to serve the people in central, northern, and northwestern Illinois. That's why I was so proud when my team was honored as the top Democratic office for constituent services in Congress. Goal number two, to deliver funding to help our communities. Well, in 2021, I was the top House Democrat in bringing home federal community project funding. And goal number three, to listen to the people I serve and focus on solutions, such as when I helped pass two farm bills and prepare for a third, helped pass two surface transportation packages, wrote, passed, and enacted, and saw enacted groundbreaking legislation to restore the rights of sexual assault and harassment survivors, and worked across the aisle to secure the largest investment in the Mississippi River since the Great Depression. Each of these accomplishments speaks to who I have always looked out for, our family farmers and nearly 10,000 family farms that I represent. They are why I served on the House Agriculture Committee every year since I've been in Congress our 90,000 labor households. That's why I fought to make sure that we passed bipartisan, once in a lifetime, gener generational investment in rebuilding our infrastructure. And our working men and women, the people I met at every supermarket Saturday who took a moment to chat in the grocery store aisles. And during 120 sherry on shifts, that we, which is what we call our own job shadow version. During my sherry on shifts, I was a baker a cattle auctioneer, a towboat operator, and I even drove a Zamboni. Every Sherry on Shift gave me a firsthand view of how hard people work to support their families and what they need from us here in Washington. Like when Sarah Miller in Galesburg, Illinois, reached out to me. The mother of two young children, Sarah's drinking water had lead in it. But in order for her to afford to fix it, she would have had to drop out of nursing school. So I helped the city secure $4 million in grants. And Sarah became one of several hundred families to have their solid lead water pipes replaced. This is me working on replacing water pipes. Listening to the stories of the people I serve has helped guide the work that I've done in Congress. But no one succeeds alone. Everything I have accomplished has been with the help and support of others. So I'd like to say thanks. Thanks to those who taught me what it means to lead, to Majority Leader Steny Hoyer, who has always been a true friend, to Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who proved that even while navigating treacherous waters, we never have to lose our way, and to my mentor, Senator Dick Durbin, without whom I would not be standing here today. When I was first elected, I was told it wasn't possible to make friends in Washington, but I was lucky enough to find a group of truly best friends here. Thank you to the pink ladies, Congresswoman Lois Frankel, Grace Meng, Annie Custer, Julia Brownlee, and our whip-elect Catherine Clark, who are truly outstanding leaders for our nation. Thank you to everyone who has been part of Team Bustos over the years, and to the most important part of my team, my family. My sister Lynn, our three sons, Tony, Nick, and Joey, our daughters-in-law, our grandchildren. Our families don't sign up for the long hours and missed birthdays, but I have had their support every step of the way. And thank you most to my husband, Jerry. Jerry and I first met with, when he was a rookie police officer and I was a rookie police reporter. Two weeks ago, he retired after almost 40 years in law enforcement as the sheriff of Rock Island County. He has stood by me all of these years. Finally, I wanna say thank you to the people of the 17th Congressional District of Illinois. I am humbled that for a decade you put your faith in me. Thank you. I've been honored to be your voice here in Washington. 
Congresswoman Sherry Bustos, Democrat from Illinois, farewell speech on the House floor December 13th. John Katko is Republican from New York, first won election to Congress in 2014, and is the ranking Republican now on the Homeland Security Committee and did not seek re-election this year. He is another of the 10 House Republicans who voted to impeach former President Trump. He gave his farewell speech on the House floor December 14th. Mr. Speaker, I rise today after eight years of service and gratitude for this body and the people of Central New York who have entrusted me to represent them in Congress since 2015. When I first ran for Congress, I left a job that I absolutely loved as a federal prosecutor, trying cases involving organized crime, murder, political corruption, drug trafficking, and every manner of awful crime you can imagine. As a prosecutor, politics never mattered to me. I worked alongside public servants every day who sought to bring justice to victims of crime. We were united in our mission to make our community a better place. And I brought this similar approach to Congress, and I dare say it has worked. I am proud of the work we have done over the past eight years. When I say we, I'm talking about myself, my staff, and my colleagues to solve serious problems and unite people across this great land. I focused on unifying issues, and I regularly introduced bills with Democratic co-sponsors. In fact, almost every bill I introduced, I would not introduce until I had a Democratic lead on, it, on that bill. I broke with my own party time and again when it was in the best interest of Central New York and America. I remained an active member of the Problem Solvers Caucus, and I am proud to have led and grown the Republican governance group to become a, become a very powerful and moderate voice in the Republican Party. And I'm proud today to give this speech while some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle are saying goodbye as well. And uh, we did a lot of good things together, and I'm very proud of them, and I'm proud to call them my friends. And I'm proud of this approach to governing, and I'm honored to have consistently ranked among the most bipartisan and effective members in all of Congress. That's not me ranking it, or my friends, that's in independent groups. It yielded passage of nearly 100 bills in my name and the enactment of laws by presidents from both parties. And most importantly, I was able to work across party lines time and again to deliver results for Central New York. We delivered a bipartisan infrastructure package, secured historic investments for domestic semiconductor manufacturing in Central New York that has now brought a manufacturer to Central New York who's going to invest $100 billion in Central New York. Stunning. We lowered taxes for the middle class. We began work on addressing the opioid epidemic and mental health crisis. And we've worked on efforts to strengthen cybersecurity, improve airport and transportation security, and protect our homeland. In the past year alone, we brought home nearly $9 million in funding for initiatives that will improve the quality of life across our district. And of course, this has not been a one-man operation. I could not have had these successes without a tremendous amount of support. I've been blessed with family, friends, health, and most loving and patient wife you could possibly imagine, Robin. I've been supported by an incredible staff, some of whom I see here today, and I'm so glad you're here. I've been supported by faithful members across Central New York who diligently worked on the House Homeland Security Committee as well and to make our nation safer. Four times my constituents in Onondaga, Cayuga, Wayne, and Oswego counties elected me to be their voice in Congress. And they have consistently provided me with valuable and oftentimes very frank input. And I've guided my decisions, to say the least. These constituents are not just Republicans, and they're not just Democrats, and they're not just independents, but they're all my constituents, and I profoundly understood that. And I'm eternally, great, and I'm eternally grateful for their input. Serving Central New York has been an honor that I can't possibly tell you. I got it here. I just... Finally, as my time in Congress comes to an end, I urge my colleagues, Republicans and Democrats, to consider the impact of working across the aisle as they should seek the many challenges ahead. Through my eight years in Congress, I've consistently drawn inspiration from the relationship between two diametrically opposed political giants from the 1980s, Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill. They were able to compromise and make progress on issues today that seem unfathomable, tax reform, tax cuts, immigration reform, and social security reform. Imagine trying to do that today in this divided house. They did it not because of personal political gain, they did it because of the love for the country, and we should all be instructed by that. While Congress is seemingly more divided than ever, our inability to find common ground is making us less competitive, on the world stage less prosperous, and getting in the ways of solving big problems. 
We were all sent here by our constituents to put the work in, to better our districts. And when there's only fights and no bipartisan cooperation, it's our constituents, not us, who suffer. And please remember that. I made working across the aisle a priority during my eight years in the House, and I can leave here knowing I achieved real results along with my great team. And I worked every day to make my district in Central New York and this country better. So for the last time, Mr. Speaker, as a member of the United States House of Representatives, I yield back. Congressman John Katko, Republican from New York, on the House floor December 14th. You can get more farewell speeches by members of the House and Senate who are leaving after this year at cspan.org, our video library. And thanks for listening to Washington Today. Sign up for C-SPAN's evening newsletter, Word for Word, to get the stories Washington is talking about sent to your inbox every day. Subscribe at c-span.org forward slash connect. Have a good night. This week, watch Washington Journal's special Holiday Week author series, featuring live segments each morning with a new writer. Coming up Thursday morning, historian Craig Shirley discusses his book, April 1945, The Hinge of History. Watch Washington Journal live Thursday morning, starting at 7 Eastern for our special Authors Week series on C-SPAN or on C-SPAN Now, our free mobile video app.